Shalom and welcome to another time of Israel's Hope Bible Church Online. My name is Ron Grossman and we're continuing our studies this time for December 23rd, 2020 and we're continuing in the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 16 and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10 on this lesson day. Let's stop and ask the Holy Spirit to lead us in what we say and do here. Father God, we do thank you for everyone looking in. We ask now that you would guide and direct in everything said and done that you would receive all the glory and honor, and we pray this all now in Jesus' name. Amen. Follow with me, please, as we read from Acts chapter 16, the first ten verses. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him Paul would have go forth with him, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith, and increased in number daily. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, and they were to come to Mysia, they were assayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And there stood a man of Macedonia, and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. We're seeing a major um, change here in the guidance, the direction of where the gospel is going. We are seeing the gospel now going to Europe for the first time. The gospel going to the more western world, if we can refer to it like this. Now let's start at the beginning of chapter 16. Let's set the context of time and place. In the previous chapter of chapter 15, where the Jerusalem Council was given, and Paul and Barnabas were sent back to the churches that they had been to, and they took the letter with them that spoke about uh, the Gentile believers not needing to keep the law. And they delivered these letters, uh, delivered the judgment to all of the churches to encourage them. Paul and Barnabas, though, have a breakup of their relationship, their uh, working the gospel in chapter 15, starting in verse 36, and he is replaced, Barnabas is replaced by um, Silas. Now, Silas was identified earlier on as a prophet, chapter 30, 15, verse 32, and so he had been sent with Paul and Barnabas from the church in Jerusalem, so he was a good choice to replace uh, Barnabas, who now leaves the scene. We never hear from Barnabas again. Silas stays with Paul. Another thing that's positive about Silas is that he is a Roman citizen like Paul, and that will be helpful because of some of the experiences and things that they are going to encounter as they continue on in their work of sharing the gospel. Now, in verse uh, 1 of uh, chapter 16, it speaks about Timothy joining Paul and Silas. They came to Derby and Lystra, and they find this disciple there. His name is Timothy, it says of a certain woman who was a Jewess. So his mother was Jewish, but his father, and he believed, but his father was a Greek. So it was a, uh, a Greek and, or a non-Gentile uh, uh, marriage to a Jewish person. The word Greek here oftentimes is, is used uh, to it just indicate someone who is not of um, Hebrew background. He is well reported of, it says, by uh, the brethren at Lystra and Iconium. So Timothy had a good reputation, and Paul seized on that. He took him, as it says in verse 3, uh, to go forth with him. In other words, come with me, I, you can be of service. And Timothy will have two letters that are written specifically to him as a um, uh, pastor of a church in Ephesus and amongst other places. Now, there's a little bit of a controversy, you might say, here in verse 3. Paul takes Timothy and has him circumcised. Now, circumcision is the physical sign of the covenant 
on the body of those who are of the house of Israel. And Timothy was born of a half and half background, Gentile and Jewish background. Now, biblically, if your father is Jewish, it, then you are Jewish. The mother can be a Gentile, but if the father is Jewish, you are Jewish. You are of Hebrew background. And how do we know that? Well, the call is to Abraham, not Sarah. It is furthered along in Isaac, furthered to Jacob, and then to the 12 tribes headed up by the men who are the 12 tribes of the house of Israel. Now there are some people in uh, the 21st century who would say that that is uh, against uh, our thinking and uh, it shows that there is a misogyny or other related things. Look, the bottom line is that the scriptures are patrilineal. They're not matrilineal. Well, today you'll get people who will say, but uh, the rabbis say if the mother's Jewish, then the children are Jewish. Well, that didn't come in until about the time of the Crusades through Europe. Sadly, many people calling themselves Christians pillaged Jewish quarters uh, throughout Europe. Um, people were killed because of who they were. Women were raped and some of them bore children. And the rabbis and the leadership of the House of Israel dispersed through Europe did not know what to do. So there was a Talmudic edict that basically came down. That's how I'll refer to it. It's rabbinic. And it said, if the mother is Jewish, then the children are Jewish. It's not biblical. It never has been. And so it is wrong. So you see here, Timothy is of a Jewish mother but a Gentile father. So he is considered to be Gentile in the biblical account of things. And this is how Paul would have looked at it. But Paul would know and did know and others knew of Timothy that he came of some Jewish heritage. So it was advantageous, it would seem, to uh, have Timothy circumcised. Now, Dr. Ed Heinsen says this, at first, the circumcision of Timothy seemed strange in light of the recent decrees of the Jerusalem Council, which is Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 24. The very decrees that Paul is now proclaiming. But the context makes it clear that Paul's purpose in the circumcision of Timothy was not for salvation, but for service, and that he wanted Timothy to go forth with him. Paul knew that Timothy's ministry to the Jewish people would be hampered if he remained uncircumcised. Now, it's not like someone was going to uh, say, well, you got to prove this to us, but it obviously might come up in the context of that time and place. That is he a circumcised one or not? This is how the Jewish people were referred to at that time, the circumcised ones. Paul's practice was to do all things that would help to win men to Christ. And this is the reason why. He was willing to give up all of his personal rights, 1 Corinthians 9 verses 19 to 23, in order to see men saved. And this was the same purpose here that was probably given to Timothy. Obviously, Timothy was in agreement to us. So, they knew that his father was a Greek, but they also knew that his mother was not. So, Timothy was circumcised, verse 3. And let's leave that there now. I think we've explained it as, as best as possible. In verse 4, it says here, they went through the cities and they delivered them the decrees to keep, the decrees of the Jerusalem council, that were ordained of the, the apostles and were set apart by the apostles and elders who were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established. The word there established can be better understood as strengthened in the face in the faith and increased in number daily. So here's the, the number one teaching point here. Good Bible doctrine, good Bible teaching strengthens the church and adds to the church. People are added to it. They hear the gospel. They hear it clearly proclaimed. The biggest problem we see, I see in the 21st century church is an abandonment of basic and good exegetical Bible teaching. A lot of reference and, and a focus on things that were never focused and referenced on before in, in many evangelical churches. 
to say today that you're a literalist with the scripture and that you take a literal view of God's plan for Israel, God's plan for the church, and God's future restoration of Israel, which is all very clearly spelled out in the Bible. I've had people look at me and say, God's done with Israel. You've got to get with it. That teaching is old hat. You got to leave that behind. You cannot tell me to leave behind who I am as a Jewish person, a follower of Jesus. And this is what the Apostle Paul wanted to do here, to make sure that Timothy, who was known to have Jewish heritage in him, could not be a stumbling block to the presentation of the gospel to both Jewish and Gentile people in this place. So they're proceeding to go forth with Timothy, and now that they have strengthened the existing churches, they want to go forward to preach the gospel. Now, and that starts with verse 6, and we're going to go through verse 6 to 10. We're going to see something that happens here. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, and Asia would be literally the Roman province of Asia. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed, or they tried. The old English word essayed here means tried. They tried to go into Bithynia. But again, it says, the Spirit suffered them or did not permit them to go. And they passed by Mysia and came down to Troas. So they wanted to go and continue in the Roman province of Asia to bring the gospel to people there where they had been working. Paul had an idea in his mind. He saw what was on the road map and he wanted to go to those places. I guess he had this ordered attitude of, about things, which is a picture of how he does his writing. He's very ordered in how he wrote things and explained them to us. However, he is not being permitted by the Holy Spirit to go forward like this. Look at verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him. Literally, it means pleaded with him, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And verse 10 says this, and after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly, gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. Assuredly here meaning concluding that they knew that God had called them to preach the gospel to these people in Macedonia. Macedonia is the northern area of the, the uh, country of Greece today. And Macedonia had been the place of many people who had come and conquered the world. Uh, Alexander the Great, his father Philip, um, the known world at that time. And so Macedonian, Macedonia was a known era, area. It was on the European continent. It was over the Aegean Sea. And so Paul thought we should continue in Asia. The Holy Spirit said, no, come, I'll show you a vision. It doesn't say who this man is. It doesn't have to be anyone. It is a picture of someone saying, come, help us. Now there's a, another good lesson to draw out of this here. And that lesson is simply this is that when we go ahead of God, we go without him. It is the Holy Spirit that draws Paul and Silas and Timothy to leave Mas uh, Asia behind and go to Europe, go to Macedonia. And this will be the beginning of the proliferation of the gospel into Europe, which will eventually cover all of Europe which will eventually one day find its way to North and South America, the New World. God's order of things is very, very clear. Now, the New World wasn't discovered. Uh, there's a lot of dispute over that. Some say it was Columbus. Others say it was the Vikings who came in the eight and nine hundreds. Whatever, it doesn't matter. The real establishment of North America came when after the Columbian era, Columbus era, had begun, that many people left Europe to come to this new world because they wanted to be able to worship in freedom. And this was what the background of coming to 
the new world was all about. But it didn't happen and couldn't happen unless someone brought the gospel first to Europe, because it was Europeans who sailed across the Atlantic and settled in North and South America. People from Spain, Portugal, Holland, and Great Britain and France. And they came, and many came with them to preach the gospel. Now, I'm, I'm really getting ahead of myself here, I know. But it, it tells you something about what really happened as a result of the work that was initiated here in this chapter. And the bottom line is this, is that the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul took the gospel to Europe with his, uh, with the approval of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, the gospel has never stopped going forward. Now, Paul will go back to Jerusalem, and I think he goes back to Jerusalem later on in a couple of chapters from now, in the small s spirit, in his own spirit. And from there, we'll see what happens. God allows us to do things that he doesn't want us to do. It's called his permissive will. But when we go where he wants us to go, we accomplish his or overall will, and not only that, show the sovereignty of who he is, that he is Lord over everything. When we do it God's way, it goes God's way. And this is how Paul went forward here. So, this is what we do at Israel's Hope Ministries. We endeavor to do it God's way. This message is being prepared for the 23rd of December, which is just two days before the time of year that we celebrate Christmas. Now, I know that many people say that Jesus was not born on December 25th, and I may have mentioned this here a week or so ago. No, he wasn't born on December 25th, but this Jewish guy was, and I preached the gospel. But that's not the point. The point is that Jesus came into this world at the appointed time. The fact that we choose the 25th of December to remember that he came at the appointed time is neither here nor there. It could have been the 1st of June that was chosen. It doesn't matter because nobody knows the exact date of Jesus' birth. It wasn't December 25th, I want to tell you. But the bottom line is that God fulfilled his promise and came in the person of Jesus at the right time of history, of the right tribe of the house of Israel, born in the right place so that he could go to that cross in order to pay the penalty of sin for all mankind, Jewish and Gentile alike. This is what we teach through the work of Israel's Hope Ministries. And we're hoping that you may see fit to come alongside the work of Israel's Hope. We're trying to close the year off with some giving that would help us to finish well so that we may be able to start well. And we're asking the Lord for an extra $5,000 before the end of this year, December 31st. If the Lord might direct you to participate in that, we would praise God for that. But overall, we ask you to pray. You can go to our webpage at www.ihopecanada.org and there you can find um, how uh, you can give to this ministry by an e-transfer or PayPal. You can also find our regular mailing address and send a check in the mail if you so see fit to use the snail mail and, uh, and bank checks. If you are in the United States and are watching this and would like to give to the work of Israel's Hope Ministries, uh, you may do that to get an IRS uh, acceptable receipt. Send a check to I Hope USA, 2330 Norton Lane, North Bloomfield, Ohio, 44450. Make sure you put on the memo line of the check for Grossman's Support Canada. In the interim, Go to our webpage, www.ihopecanada.org, and there you'll find on the support icon all kinds of different ways, like I said, by an e-transfer, by PayPal, or a regular check via the mail. Um, there are some 
help, uh, some Bible helps there you can find, including a very interesting brochure written by a missionary, Larry Linton, who has been in Mysticeny Lake, Quebec, for the duration of his ministry in, in uh, subarctic Canada and Quebec. It's called The Sovereignty of God, and it's a great read. You'll find it there. You'll also find our most recent prayer update there as well. Thank you for looking in today. Let's close our time in prayer. Father God, thank you for each person who has looked in today. Thank you for eternal life in Jesus. Thank you for loving us to meet our needs as only you can. And we pray that you would meet those needs through to the end of this month. And pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So until next time, we say Shalom.